If you are sitting at home next to your radio, you're hearing the music faster than you are if you're in the hall. Listening for the secret, searching for the sound. This is the Sound Podcast with Ira Haberman. Well, we have the memories and the music. The fact that so many great moments in our scene's history have been captured on film in photos is another added bonus. More to the point, those that continue to document the ebbs and flows of the scene in photographs are doing incredible work. That's certainly the case for Bob Minkin, who has spent decades following and photographing all of our beloved musicians and their fans. For him, it was a dream to move out to Marin County in Northern California to live amongst the community in its fiery core. And while he didn't make it out west from Brooklyn until 1990, he had been dreaming of that very thing from an early age. And as he recounts, it all started back in 1977. You know, I was fascinated with it because, well, hey, you know, all my favorite, most of my favorite bands lived in this area. And, you know, I just was enthralled with the whole you know, Marin County, San Francisco music scene. You know, I was, I read, um, I read on the road and I read, uh, on the, the electric Kool-Aid acid test by Tom Wolf. And that just all added to the mythology in my mind of this area as a young, you know, as a kid. And then I finally got to visit here you know, that summer in 77. And, uh, it was all it was cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I, you know, I've only been uh, to the Oakland slash San Francisco area once, and I, and that was '91. And I, everything in me thinks about uh, heading back that way, um, and eventually, hopefully, we'll make that pilgrimage. Um, but, but tell me about uh, the years between between '77 and '90, uh, or or when you moved out to Marin. You were still very active in the community, seeing the dead and other other bands that you were, uh, that you liked, obviously, on the East Coast. Um, sure. Did you experiment with taking photographs then, or was this something that had to wait till you actually um, um, had access to them in a, in a more reasonable way? Well, no, I started out, um, you know, I started going to concerts, you know, when I fell in with this um, unsavory group of people, <laughs> no, just this group of people um, in my neighborhood, I grew right. up in Brooklyn, New York. Right. So around uh, the end of 1972, I was like 13 years old, and I kind of fell in with this crowd who uh, turned me on to a lot of things, including um, great music, you know, like Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Allman Brothers, and, and of course The Dead, and, and, you know, similar stuff, Johnny Winter, and... Um, so, you know, this has kind of been, you know, these are kind of people I began hanging out with, right? So then, um, push forward two years later, uh, 1974, uh, I turned 15 that year, and then the idea of going to see these people play at concerts seemed uh, like, wow, this is something I want to do. So I began going to concerts that summer, in 74. First concert I went to was. Eric Clapton at uh, Roosevelt Stadium in New Jersey. You know, I loved the cream and Derek and the Dominoes, and Clapton was kind of off the radar for a while back then. So when he came out with his 4 461 Ocean Boulevard album, that this was the tour that I guess supported that. So I was able to get a ticket and went to the show, and it was like, whoa, <laughs> this is fun. So uh, a few months later, I decided, you know, I was always like a collector. I always liked documenting things, and, you know, I had like a stamp collection, comic book collection, all that stuff that a lot of kids had back then but when I started going to concerts I wanted to have some kind of um, I guess a memorabilia of it a, a you know a souvenir so at, I was in the fall of 74 I went to see the new riders of the purple sage at the Academy of Music in New York and I brought my little Kodak Instamatic camera and that's really where it started you know from there um, you know these are just you know snapshots taken with a crappy camera but but by the sum, summer of 77, I was starting to take, like, good pictures. And around that time, I met the publisher of Relics Magazine that was based in Brooklyn. And they covered all this music. That's the focus of their music was, like, Grateful Dead and New Riders and all that stuff. So they began publishing my photos then in the, in the uh, summer of 77. And then I thought, I'm on to something here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and, and what kind of support did you get from, I mean, you're 18 at this point and probably well on your way to going to college, I would assume, but this is something that you want to do as a, as a sideline, as a hobby, or is it something that you kind of knew would one day you, you would do professionally at that point? Well, I don't know if I really thought it through that much. You know, I was um, always kind of a, in, in the creative world. You know, I used to draw and paint, and at 18, um, I applied, uh, the college I went to was in Manhattan called School of Visual Arts, and they had a full um, commercial art, as they called it, program, graphic design, fine art, and photography. So that was in Manhattan, and uh, I lived in Brooklyn, so I lived with my parents and just commuted to school every day. So I was in Manhattan basically every day from my, my school years there were 77 to 81, four years. And, you know, that afforded me great opportunity to see all kinds of acts. I mean, you know, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty open-minded. I used to, I mean, when like punk, punk rock scene came about, you know, I used to go to a lot of those shows. It necessarily wasn't my, you know, necessarily the thing I was totally into, but I still dug it, you know, like the, you know, the Ramones and the Clash and people like bands like that. Uh, and so after graduating, um, you decided to do this more full-time, obviously, and, and sort of... Play. Well, it was kind of split. I mean, my main career, so to speak, at the time, as, you know, being 21 or 22 years old out of college, was to uh, be an art director for, like, a in a creative place, like for, a, for an ad agency. something. But, you know, photography I did basically then on the side. But then as time went on, photography kept, you know creeping up into that percentage of time spent and, and you know, income, basically, you know. So until nowadays, it's, um, it's about half and half, you know, with my, you know, marketing web design business and photography, or maybe even a little more, you know. So um, it was something like I kind of, they coexist. I mean, doing, you know, web design or, or, or back then graphic design and photography, they're, they're intermingled. So I, didn't, I never really saw, it, saw them that separately from each other back then. So let's fast forward to the move to Marin in, in uh, the early 90s. 1990, I think, is, is uh, when you moved out there. And how did you hook up? Obviously, they had seen you and knew of you, but how did you hook up with the Grateful Dead to, to play a more active role in, in what they were doing at that point? Well, that actually happened. I mean, well, my association, just going back a little bit, my association with Relics Magazine um, opened some doors you know, in the uh, late 70s and um, early 80s. So, you know, it gave me a platform where my work was, uh, you know, printed, reproduced, and and got me some kind of, you know, a name in that world. Um, a big breakthrough occurred in 1985 when uh, friends introduced me to Dennis McNally, who was Grateful Dead's publicist. And uh, we met uh, at a show in Pennsylvania in the summer of 85, and we hit it off. And, well, he liked me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, he kind of held, he was kind of the gatekeeper, you know, and he held the keys to the kingdom as far as I was concerned. But we had it, we had it off. We became good friends. And so from about, so from that time on, 85 on, I was regularly getting access, like photo, photo access to uh, Grateful Dead concerts. So in, um, and you know, we, we tried to move out here earlier, but you know, it was tough, you know, it's a big, big deal moving cross country. I mean, you know, my wife, you know, we got married in 86 and uh, you know, we came out in 87, my wife and I in 88, we brought our portfolios, but we, but it wasn't until 90, uh, spring of 90, we were able to actually make the move for good. We, you know, took our car and drove it, put our stuff in storage and, drove one way cross country uh to here without any job or any really even a place to live <laughs> come to wow. it. Uh, but you know we have yeah go ahead ironic that the spring of 90 is when the dead were making some great music on the east coast and you you <laughs> you're exactly uh, exact just when that tour was happening we were driving west like in that you know is it like march yeah march wow. when they were playing at nassau coliseum i think and you know yeah of course around. Um, I uh, know uh, the timing was like, oh, well, <laughs> but uh, the day we arrived in San Francisco, um, 
the next day, we were at the Warfield. I was at the Warfield Theater for the first time seeing Jerry Garcia Band within like a day of getting here. And a few days after that, I saw Zero, one of my favorite bands at the Sweetwater in Mill Valley. And a couple days after that, Bob Weir was playing a show at the Warfield. So it was like, you know, and a month later, the Dead did the Shoreline run. So, I mean, you know, it just went in, you know, <laughs> jumped right in <laughs> as soon as we got here. And you've been, you've been sort of doing that ever since, right? I mean, you've been uh, taking photos or hanging out with the band in one capacity or another since, pretty much. Uh, yeah, yeah, since, exactly. You know, I mean, coming out here, you know, you know they had a, a different structure, like different concert promoters, and, you know, it was Bill Graham Presents and stuff. So, you know, I had to kind of not totally start all over, but I did have to start over in a respect of um, kind of, integrating into the music community here you know you can't just show up and the doors just don't open but but you know people like you know dennis again dennis mcnally he lived in san francisco he and his wife susanna who's also a great photographer um introduced us to a lot of people and you know helped uh make it a soft landing you know when we got here so we connected with some bgp uh, bill graham presents people and began kind of integrating with that scene. I was still shooting, you know, with Relics Magazine back then. So, it was, you know, it all came together. You know, we we moved out for the music. We moved out because our favorite bands lived out here, and, um, you know, we weren't disappointed. Do you have a competitive thing with Jay uh, Blakesburg? I'm, o- I'm only asking because you both shoot for Relics and both do similar kinds of things, at least with the, the is it a friendly kind of rivalry or, or how competitive is, is that kind of relationship? Oh, well, it's funny. People ask me that. Um, it's, it's, it's a total friendly thing. I mean, Jay is a, you know, incredible photographer and, uh, we know each other since the late seventies. We've been friends, you know, he's from New Jersey. I'm from New York and we traveled in the same circuits, you know, for many years and we still do. In fact, uh, his, photo show is tonight san francisco and i'm gonna gonna try to make it so yeah we're we're longtime friends and uh i would say certainly friendly certainly a a friendly (laughs) rivalry i don't even really like using the word rivalry right right. really that at all but um uh yeah we're just uh friends who we traveling in the same circle and certainly support each other so uh i'm curious about the post garcia era because um, in your video, in the video that introduces the new book, which we'll get to in a, in a second, and, I, and actually we should talk about the new book in the same context, you do mention this notion of a, a renaissance in the Bay Area, and I think that has a lot to do with uh, Terrapin Crossroads, TRI, and of course uh, the new Sweetwater. Can you talk about kind of the zeitgeist or the feeling in the community around um, around the music that, that has emerged post-Jerry, and I want to say post-Grateful Dead, because, you know, with, without Jerry, there is no Grateful Dead. There's other incarnations, but, but to be truthful, it's not the Grateful Dead. Um, what is that feeling like in the community in, in San Francisco these days? Well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, l- l- last night, for example, uh, I photographed the show at the uh, Terrapin Crossroads. It was a band called California Kind, which is... Essentially, uh, Barry Sless, Rob Rocco, John Molo, Pete Sears, and Katie Skeen. But what made it really special last night was, and this kind of leads into what your question is, uh, David Nelson, you know, David Nelson, New Riders of Purple Sage, David Nelson, you know, he's uh, had some health issues over the past year and hasn't performed in, in a year, you know, since uh, then. So last night um, was uh, this, like the second time he came to the stage at Terrapin, uh, or uh, for anywhere, and to play with uh, join his old cohorts uh, from David Nelson Band in um, at this show last night at Sweet at the uh, Terrapin. So we were, I was talking with some people there about it of how lucky we are to live here and see these, see these kinds of things on a regular basis. And and what somebody said like you know this like family they really you know these kinds of shows have become you know there's it's really like a family event. It's something that um, I've never experienced before living anywhere else. And it certainly really wasn't even before five years ago, before the Sweetwater and Terrapin reopened, uh, or ter- Sweetwater reopened and Terrapin opened. Um, you, you know, there was like a dearth after Jerry was gone. 
you know, I was wondering like how it was all going to play out. And then eventually Phil Lesh started, came out and started doing his friend, Phil and friends things. Bob Weir, you know, for, had rat dog. And a lot of these shows were in the San Francisco, in the city, at, like Fillmore and places like that. But Marin, despite all its musical heritage, really, uh, once the old Sweetwater, the original Sweetwater closed in 2007, there was not a lot happening here too much. There was some great clubs in Fairfax, but there wasn't like a, I don't know, scene, you know, around it, a, a, a thing. So in 2012, simultaneously, within a few months of each other, Terrapin Crossroads opened in San Rafael and uh, Sweetwater reopened a few blocks away from its original location. And all of a sudden, there was a lot of music, great music happening. Some musicians that live here, they didn't have to travel very far. And in Phil Lesh's case, you know, he has put together this kind of cast of musicians, people, you know, a a younger up-and-coming group, people like... um, like in the band Midnight North that his son is in and other bands that uh, featuring uh, like Ross James and uh, like Alex Coford and Scott Law, who comes down here a lot from Portland where he lives, has become a seven night a week. Hey, seven, even in the daytime, they have afternoon shows and bar shows and yard shows. I mean, so there's this musical community like which I don't think has really uh, exists anywhere else if you like the kind of music and you know, the fact that Sweetwater and Terrapin are located like 15 minutes from each other and featured their own different acts and lineups. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That's why I titled the book, the music never. Yeah. Stopped. I was going to say it's a great segue into the book because the book is the music never stopped. And while you certainly have, um, photos, um, uh, historical photos of the musicians that played uh, Marin back in the day. That isn't where the story stops, and I'm so glad that you know you you you've taken the time to document what's happened post Jerry and certainly post uh, uh, the New Century. In that there is a continual a continuing of the dialogue and certainly of the music that that made that part of the country so famous, right? Yes, it's almost like it's been reborn. I mean, there are, there's so many young people at these shows, people who they never saw Jerry, you know. Well, but but yet, you know, it speaks to them, that music, that feeling, that um, vibe, that wish, you know, <laughs> that the music invokes. So, you know, the creativity. And um, so, you know, I was thinking of doing a new book, you know, following up, my first book, Live Dead, and I was thinking of doing like a post Grateful Dead book, but the scope was too massive because I was trying to like rein it in a little. Like, how can I frame this in a in a way that tells an interesting story without it just being like a zillion photographs? So, focusing, I realized I can just focus just on Marin County, and that can encapsulate really the, the story, the post Jerry Dead story of where things are, where things have gone, and where things are going. Do you think that, um, and we ask musicians this question all the, all the time, and, and certainly, you know, we've had Ross James on the show, we've had Graham Lesh on the show, so they've answered it in their own way, but do you think it's it's the community? Do you think it's the music? Do you think it's, do you think it's that, that idea of, of community and music? What, what, is the, what is the special sauce that kind of keeps the music going um, so that it, it never does kind of cease or stop? What, what do you think it is? Well, you know, I think it started with the fact that the original band members support support this. You know, Phil Lesh and Bob Weir, you know, Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzmann to other extents. So I think that kind of is like this was the spark, you know, that gets, you know, because people want to, you know, see Bob Weir and Phil and, and the other guys. But now that the engine is kind of running, and adding the, you know, like people you mentioned, like the musicians you mentioned, Ross and Graham, into the mix with a whole nother crowd, it kind of allowed them to be brought to a, a wider community, their music. And it's now, well, accepted, I don't know, not accepted, but it's, um, 
it stands on its own. It's, it's a great thing on its own. So it is kind of a passing the torch. So I guess the initial spark, um, so yeah, it's a combination, of course, of the creativity, the community, the location, you know, Marin County, the venues, which are very welcoming and have incredible sound systems and just they're fun to be at. And, and, the, and the regular, the regularity, regularity, is that the um, of the music uh, there, like, you know, on a consistent basis, and the quality level just keeps is just fantastic. I mean, now, you know, let's say Ezra Lip, who is a drummer in some of these uh, Terrapin bands, he has his own band now, and and uh, putting out an album soon. You know, Alex Coford, who's also a drummer in, in these configurations, has his his band Colonel and the Mermaids, and of course Graham with Midnight North. So it's. Um, it's something like, how does it succeed? Like, how did the Grateful Dead succeed? It's just this, this combination of events that uh, reached a critical mass. But the spark, of course, is the fact we have original surviving members still active that was able, I think, to give it a push. Right. They're kind of incubating the experience still. I mean, I, yeah. Oh, you're going to see Phil Lesh at Terrapin, and then there's these other people playing with him you, you know, most people probably weren't as familiar with. But then as went on and you saw them more often you come to see them on their own as as great musicians and coming out with their own original material that 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 extends the time you know it's like it's part of the timeline of of music that started well i guess way back in the blues days you know in the 20s and 30s into the jazz 40s into the beat era in the 50s and 60s and finally into the um you know, the uh, San Francisco sound, you know, back then, and and just how it's morphed. You know, you have bands now like Widespread Panic and Fish, while they don't sound like the Grateful Dead, but it they still kind of embody that spirit, like letting people tape the shows and kind of having that thing where people, they play a different show each night where people want to see them all. Uh, and it's not just uh, Phil and Bobby, but there are people like, and you mentioned them, um, you know, David Nelson or even Pete Sears or, or Yorma and, and Kim Hock too, who are also still very prevalent in the scene, but are also bringing up, you know, I, I think about Steve's band and how he's incorporated his son and, and uh, Leslie Mendelson and other people in the band, too, that are that are up and comers. I mean, it seems like the passing of the torch is happening in, in such sacred hollow ground that, that uh, no doubt uh, these people are going uh, to, no doubt that their music is going to live on through either their own offspring or through people that they've kind of brought into the scene. Exactly. You know, I saw Steve Kimmock uh, last week in New York debuting uh, material for his new album. And uh, sure, Leslie Mendelssohn, who... You know, I, I, I wasn't familiar with until a few years ago when I saw her play with uh, uh, this uh, band with Bob Weir and Bernie Worrell at uh, Great American Music Hall. And, you know, right away, you know, I was taken, you know, captivated by her voice and presence. And then, you know, now last week she regularly plays with Steve. And a really uh, sweet thing is Steve's son, John, John Kimmock. You know, in the book, uh, in the early, like, in, you know, like in the 90s, John used to, as a, as a, young child, you know, a few years old, used to stay, play on stage banging his own drums. <laughs> little drums. So uh, it's just remarkable to see, like, you know, 25 years later, here he is, you know, touring with his dad. And in my book, The Music Never Stopped, I have a really sweet photo from that uh, era where Zero is on stage playing an outdoor show in Fairfax. And there's John on the drums. And then, you know, I have recent shots in the book of him as, you know, now he's a young man playing with his dad. It's, so there's a real, that's a real passing of the torch right there. And, uh, and you mentioned, uh, yeah, like David Nelson Band. Now David Nelson Band, uh, with David on a hiatus, the rest of the band members formed a band called California Kind. And they brought into the fold now Katie Skeen, a remarkable singer and guitar player from Southern California. So... Now she's becoming familiar to the audiences. You know, I just saw them last night. So it's so, you know, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful how it just keeps pushing forward and bringing new people into the mix. And It's great. Uh, the Music Never Stop is available now. It features over 500 images. How do you go about picking 
the images that you want to put in a in a book like this. I'm I'm sure you've taken thousands of of images, if not hundreds of thousands of images, over the the period that uh, that's in the book. How do you go about, you know, figuring out how to cut it down to something that that makes sense as a as a coffee table book? Yeah, that that's one of the most that's one of the most difficult and time consuming th- things in the process. And you know, it was the same thing even with the Live Dead book. I didn't want it to be an encyclopedia, you know, so. I wanted to have a flow and a story. So in the case of the music never stopped, you know, it had a thing where there was the the past of Marin bringing it into the the new Marin. And, um, you know, the, the way I laid it out, because I, I did all the layout, that's, you know, my pr- profession, you know. So um, I wanted it to tell a story. Like the photos aren't just laid out in a way where photo here, photo there. They They all relate to each other. So... Many times I need a photo of of, a, of the person, the, the key person in the photo facing like to the left or facing to the right. So it interacts correctly with the photo that's next to it. So there was some, you know, there's a lot going on. Sometimes I had a great shot. It just didn't fit anywhere. And so it was disqualified, you know. And each time I looked at the book, I kept refining it. It's kind of like distilling something. Like you start out with something and you get it down and down. You start out with something that's maybe like 100 pounds and then you're getting it down to 50 to 20 to 10 to the really potent, you know, down to a gram, you know, that's like super potent. And that's what I wanted the book to be like. I wanted to get it down to like where it was like had the most impact. Like when you look at it, you just get drawn in. So the photos, you know, they, they had to relate to one another. They also, I also wanted to represent a lot of musicians, so I had to cover a lot of ground. Like I wanted to make sure people were adequately represented. I wanted to honor them, honor the musicians. And in addition to that, I have this fan photos in here, people at the shows themselves enjoying themselves and interacting with the, with the, with the concert. So I wanted to have a certain amount of that in there as well. So the editing process went on and on. And even once the book was pretty much finalized, uh, even in, in the days leading up to when I had to re- actually release it to the printer, I was making changes and rearranging things up until, <laughs> up until the day it went to the printer. And ultimately, I'm, I'm, very, you know, I'm very happy with it. You know, it's 208 pages, you know, 12 inches wide, 9 inches high, 3.5 pounds of musical goodness. Uh, have you moved uh, exclusively to digital at this point? You mentioned that you were shooting last night. I'm curious, and I think there's an event I'm going to ask you about in a bit, but are you exclusively shooting on digital at this point, or or do you still sort of play with film as well? Uh, I, I exclusively shoot digital now since um, 2005 when I made the switch. And... Um, because, you know, I was just afraid of the quality back then, and, you know, there were some issues with digital, but um, those have long been ironed out. Uh, so, yeah, I shoot exclusively digital, and I, I work, uh, I use a program called Lightroom, which is funny because I used to work in a dark room all the time. <laughs> right. And now it's like, hey, I'm out in the light. The, um, you know, the, 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 the theory and all that behind photography hasn't really changed. You know, you still have to have a, composition, an eye for composition, an eye for what's a, you know, a great shot that's impactful and emotional and all that. So none of that's changed. You know, the whole thing with shutter speeds and exposures and all that, same thing. None of that's really changed. It's just a, it's a different medium, you know, but it, it allows you to uh, capture like a, you know, a wider range. You know, slide film was, had a very narrow range. You know, you really had to have your exposure spot on. I mean, I like to joke, like film days, you really had to know what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a fact, you know. Uh, these days, um, with digital, you know, you can get away with a lot, <laughs> put it that way. But that doesn't hurt me. To, you know, it makes it better, you know, for me anyway. You can probably shoot more too, right? Like you're not as limited by how many rolls of film you're carrying with you, or how many ro- how many shots are are on a specific roll. Exactly, it gives you a lot more leeway to experiment. You know, I can experiment now to my heart's content. Sometimes that's not always a good thing because you could, you know, perfectionism is the is the killer of getting anything done. You know, like 
trying to get something perfect and you know it can, it can never you can play around with it forever so at some point you have to be finished with something and be happy with it you know to put it out there um you know which leads me to another thing uh you know the thing about a book you know like compared because you know nowadays with facebook and instagram there's a people are bombarded with images images you know it's insane how many images and the thing is you know you see a a great image occasionally, and I say that occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> wonder, like, afterwards, like, oh, I want to come back to that image. Where to go? <laughs> and come back to it. And, you know, unfortunately, the thing about Facebook and things like that is it's kind of dumbed down things, you know. It seems like it's dumbed down people's perceptions of what is truly good, you know. People's, the bar is kind of low, you know, in that. So, in putting out a book, something tangible, something you can hold and, and hopefully cherish, you know, it um, in these days of fleeting on-screen exposure, it's uh, I think a book, a book like this, a photo book like this, really has its place. Um, thank you so much for for your work and uh, for the book. For people who are listening and want to check out or order the book, it's available at the Music Never Stopped. Book.com. Is it also available from booksellers across the country as well? Uh, no, this book is a self-published book, so it's available, you know, through me through that website you mentioned. It's also available on Amazon, so if people want to look it up there. The music never stopped. Uh, book. You know, on, on Amazon they can get it there. And I also have some book signing events. I just came back from the East Coast. I did a run there at uh, eight eight show eight events on the in the Northeast. But uh, people who were you know, different geographical areas, they can certainly, like you said, get it from Amazon or directly from my website. Cool. Thanks so much for taking the time, and uh, can't wait to check out the book and uh, and continued success. I mean, you know, you're doing something that we all dream of, being able to uh, take photos and uh, live in a place that uh, you've always wanted to live in and see the music that you always uh, wanted to see. So, so kudos to you, and thanks so much for taking the time, man. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care, Ira. Thanks a lot, man. What's notable about Bob Minkin is that he continues to document the Marin County music scene and all of its musicians, no matter where they are. And for that, we should all be grateful. If you have a chance, check out the musicneverstoppedbook.com and order it. And for more on Bob and his work, visit minkinphotography.com. You've been listening to The Sound Podcast. Technical production by Adam Karsh and Andrea Ruse. Inspired by the Grateful Dead and you, their fans. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And find us at thesoundpodcast.com.